though. <laughs> All right. 100 million. It's a big number, isn't it? When I see 100 million, I think of one third the US population, or twice the size of France, or maybe even four times the population of Australia. But let me tell you what 100 million is in context of climate change. The World Bank estimates that 100 million people will be pushed below the poverty line by the year 2030 as a result of the long-term shifts in temperature and weather patterns. Why does this matter? Well, <clears throat> this matters because this is what it looks like to be living under the poverty line. Developing countries are suffering more from the devastating consequences of climate change due to their geography, their slow economic development, and a decrease in their freshwater resources. The developing countries I'll be referring to are those that are considered low income or underdeveloped. According to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, there are currently 46 least developed countries in the world. That's nearly 13.4% of the world's population living in conditions incomprehensible to the Western world. So in essence, climate change will affect everyone, but it will be absolutely disastrous for the poor. This clear disparity is partly due to the vulnerable geography of these underdeveloped countries. Not only are the majority of poor countries today located in the warmer parts of the earth, but the majority of people living in these countries are living in coastal areas. <clears throat> the average annual temperature for developed countries is roughly 10 degrees Celsius, whereas the average annual temperature for developing countries is roughly 26 degrees Celsius. According to the American Geophysical Union, in the 2010s, the low-income region observed over 30% more heat wave days as compared to the high-income region. An example is Mali. Mali is a developing country, and it's considered the hottest nation in the world, with an average yearly temperature of about 28.83 degrees Celsius. Rising temperatures have a different effect on those living in developing countries than those living in Western Europe or North America because of their different vulnerabilities. An example is the increasing number of natural deaths that are occurring due to global warming combined with the fewer access to healthcare services. So as stated before, the majority of people living in poor countries live in coastal areas. Let's establish why this is an issue and how climate change will affect those living in these vulnerable areas. Two of many issues of global warming have been the melting, um, the recent melting of polar ice caps, and the slight oceanic, um, slight ex expansion of oceanic water due to rising ocean temperatures. Together, these are causing sea levels to rise worldwide, and in some cases, even enough to engulf cities and settlements close to current ocean lines. According to the World Bank, it is estimated that 10 cities in developing countries will account for 67 percent of the future coastal population exposure to the risks from sea level rise and storm surge. Some examples include Lego, Nigeria, and Bangkok, Thailand, which could be entirely drowned by the year 2100. This issue of rising sea levels can cause permanent inundation of coastal infrastructure, such as businesses, homes, etc. It can also cause a loss of many critical coastal resources, such as crop fields and mangroves. The World Bank also states that in South Asia, 35% of the rural coastal population is located in the low elevation coastal zone, 33% for East Asia and the Pacific, and 28% for the Middle East and North Africa. So in addition to the impact on individual livelihoods that climate change may have, it would also have drastic impacts on the already struggling economies of these underdeveloped regions. Climate change will impact every single country, regardless of wealth status. However, the impact on climate change, developing countries will face the impact of climate change on a larger scale. The economies of rich countries will still be able to operate, and their economic output will remain strong because they can invest in renewable energy and they have other sources of income. Whereas developing countries, during this time of climate change, won't be able to do that efficiently because, one, they don't have the resources to switch from carbonized energy to sustainable energy, and two, 
today their main source of income is heavily tied to agriculture, which is highly affected by climate change. So as global warming increases, affluent and therefore innovative countries, such as the US, for example, continue to find temporary solutions to mitigate the causes of increasing climate change, whereas developing countries still do not have the resources for this. Their development is therefore continually being hindered. According to a Stanford study conducted in 2019, the gap between the economic output of the world's richest and poorest countries is 25% larger today than it would have been without global warming. Unlike the rich countries, the poor countries are not going to invest in decarbonized energies as fast as the developed countries are. The challenge for developing countries is that they did not have the same opportunities as the richer countries did, in the sense that they weren't able to expand themselves in a high carbon intensive way than clean up and decarbonize later, which is what a lot of the developed countries are doing now. So <clears throat> based on this graph, we can see that there's a positive correlation between the 2010 global GDP and the impact of historical warming. The results from the Stanford study referenced earlier concluded that lower per capita GDP is generally associated with more negative impacts. Developing countries will produce less and less and their economic outputs will decrease. The rich countries depleted the planet of natural resources and excessively burned fossil fuels, which we all know is a major factor in the cause of climate change. Rich countries are now realizing that they're running extremely low on the resources and that their actions have been killing the planet. So now they're like, oh, we should do something else. But the poor countries don't have the luxury to do this something else because it would require advanced technology, investments, money, et cetera, to do all of this. Not everyone can buy EVs or put solar panels on their roofs. It's expensive. So not only do poor countries not have to take the assets to transition energy from carbonized energy to sustainable energy, but their economic outputs will also be greatly reduced due to climate change. Why? Because most of their sources of income, such as agriculture and fishing, are tightly tied to the changes in climate. You know, you, according to the UN, 75% of the world's poor living in rural areas count on natural resources, such as forests, lakes, and oceans for their livelihoods. So imagine this. You're a farmer or a fisher in a poor or low-income country. The well-being of not only yourself, but also your families is directly linked to land and water. Your collateral is your livestock, your boat, or maybe even your next harvest. You're probably already struggling to make ends meet. Now, consider the impacts of climate change. Bring on the drought. Eliminate all predictability from local rain patterns. Get ready for the extreme, um, extreme weather events, such as hurricanes, tornadoes, and wildfires, all getting more intense due to climate change. Such risks and threats to life are becoming increasingly common, more intense, and lasting longer than ever recorded in history. If you ask me, I'd be scared of what's yet to come. <clears throat> so developing countries are not only suffering from a decrease in their freshwater resources, but they're also experiencing water quality deterioration. It is proven that climate change affects the pattern of rainfall, leading to both more droughts and more floods. The irregular supply of water, both through drought and flooding, can often disrupt water availability and sanitation. According to the United States Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA, when more moisture-laden air moves over land or converges into a storm system, it can produce more intense precipitation, for example, heavier rain and snowstorms. Current climate change and global warming is aggravating the already drastic water sanitation crisis present in many third world countries. Climate change causes irregular rainfall patterns, so heavy rainfall and flooding can damage water sources and sanitation facilities, carry runoff and waste into streams and lakes, and contaminate the water supply. When atmospheric temperature increases, so do ocean temperatures, the EPA states that in many areas, increased water temperatures will cause eutrophication and, access, and excess algae growth. Eutrophication is a natural phenomenon, also known as lake aging, um, in which nutrients accumulate in a given body of water, such as a lake, and causes an algae bloom. So due to their um, lack of policy on point source pollution, 
developing countries continue to see an increase in their water contamination. So climate change is a global issue, and it will affect every single one of us. But climate change never has and never will be a, a fair game. We, as citizens of the Earth, along with other living species, will all be losers in this. Some will lose more than others, and unfortunately, the impact of climate change and global warming on developing countries absolutely outweighs that of developed countries. So what exactly can be done about this, you may ask? Well, on a grander scale, developed countries must support developing countries in all solutions related to climate change impact. For instance, by granting funds, providing technology, and assisting, um, education, and assisting through educational development and research and collaboration with scientists between both countries. There is hope, however. There are small things we can do here in our own city that can help combat climate change. For example, something that I'm currently working on is providing clean drinking water to a rural school in Vietnam. This is my second time working with the Gravity Water Organization, and what this campaign does is all the money that we raise funds this filtration system that harvests and stores the water from the high flood season and uses the force of gravity to filter it and provide it as clean water for drinking and sanitation purposes. There are many ways that individual, individuals can help donate to the right organizations that help fight this at a larger scale. Since the causes of um, climate change have been global, the solutions must be as well. Thank you.